And when he had returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Well, I hope that your Christmas and New Year's holidays were joyous and safe over the last couple of weeks. Um, we have had the time to visit family, and uh, it has been uh, short weeks at work, but relaxing and busy, and, and it has just been a great time. So it's a, it's a joy to see you this morning. Looking at Mark 2, um, the account of Christ healing the paralytic, and I, and I chose this because as we leave the last year and begin this one, we are so often focused on starting over. One of my first classic movies, and this will tell you how old I am, one of my first classic movies was Forrest Gump. I know, he's so young. Um, that was, when, and I was like four when it came out, but I remember watching Forrest Gump as a kid. Uh, and there is a scene about halfway through the movie uh, where Forrest and Lieutenant Dan are celebrating New Year's in New York, um, and these um, they're at a they're at a, a bar, and these New York women come up to them, and, and they're talking, and one of them says to Forrest, "Don't you just love New Year's? You get to start over. Everyone gets a second chance." And I really like that. I like thinking about that this time of year. It sums up the hope and optimism that we often find ourselves just feeling right now. Many of us are, are starting new habits or breaking bad habits. We're starting new hobbies or trying to get rid of bad hobbies. Uh, maybe you're like me and you're like, diet and exercise, let's do it this time. We're going to do it. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I hit, I've been in the gym sporadically. It, it's, it's picking up. Maybe you have some financial goals that you're trying to hit this year, and you're like, I'm going to save, and we're not going to spend like we did the last several years, but we're going to hit those goals. But what we will see this morning is that all of these things, noble as they are, and they are good, are dwarfed by a far greater need. You see, as we have heard already, we are sinners. We have sinned against a holy and righteous God. And what we need is to be forgiven of our sins. So we re as we read the story of life's grace, my desire this morning is that you will hear Christ saying to you, your sins are forgiven. But to do that, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Father, it is a daunting thing to speak to your people on behalf of you. And this is your word. This is true. And there are um, things this morning and every morning that we need to hear. But to do that, we need you. We need to hear that our sins are forgiven. So Holy Spirit, come and illuminate this text for us. Apply it to us. Give life as only you can. We ask all these things in Christ's name and for his kingdom's sake. Amen. So right out of the gate, while prepping, 
I was struck by the unexpected. Just to walk through the text real quick. Jesus has come to Capernaum and is flocked by the people. It is very likely, based on chapter 1, that this house is Peter and Andrew's house. And Jesus has kind of made Capernaum his little, his new home. But so many people have come to hear Jesus that the house is totally full. And, and homes at this time aren't very big like they are now. These are tiny houses. But, so this is, a, this is still a pretty good sizable crowd. And I've been to concerts and I've been to sporting events where you've just kind of been bunched in. I don't like it. I like my room. But you've been on an airplane. You've been in a concert where you're just shoulder to shoulder and you can't move. You can't get around anywhere. It's like that. So then imagine the struggle of the four friends who have now come bringing this paralytic man hoping to see Jesus, hoping that this teacher will do something. And as they come to the house, they can't get in. It is, uh, the fact that there weren't fire marshals there is fortunate for this group of people that have come. It is packed. And they can't even get to the door. But unwavered, they climb the stairs that would have been on the side of the house, and leading to the roof, they get straight to work. Jesus is teaching, likely in the middle, the square middle of the house, where the people are listening intently, and then you hear the sounds of men climbing up top, and grunting, and heaving, and digging. Luke's account tells us that this is a tiled roof, so they are removing tiles and digging dirt to form a hole in the, in the roof to let this guy down. The Greek is really funny here because it's literally they unroofed the roof. <laughs> it's wonderful. So eventually the dirt starts to fall and loosen while, while everyone's hearing these, this, this construct, deconstruction crew. Surely as the dirt falls and the hole begins to form, is when the chaos starts and people start trying to get out of the way. No doubt Peter and Andrew, assuming it's their house, are upset as anyone would be if you put a hole through their roof. But these four men begin to lower down their friend through the hole, all of them believing that Jesus can and will heal him. And Jesus, full of grace and compassion, says, sees their faith and says, your sins are forgiven. And this is not what I expected. This is not what you should expect. If you're reading Mark, this story is preceded by a large and consistent practice of Jesus healing. Mark 1, Jesus heals a man with an unclean spirit. Heals him. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. The whole city of Capernaum came out and he heals all of them. Later, he touches a leper and heals him. So it's not like Jesus is incapable. And it's what he's done up to this point. At this point in Mark, we're not just expecting Jesus to heal the man. We expect it right away without controversy. So when he forgives the man's sins, me reading it went, but that's not what he came for, Jesus. Jesus. You, you did something not what he was, that's not what he wanted. He wants you to heal him. It's unexpected for us because we wouldn't regard this man as a sinner. I mean, he's paralyzed, but that's not a, we wouldn't consider that a sin, would we? He's not a tax collector. That's, he's not a thief or a murderer. This is just a man who's gotten the bad end of the stick but we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's law. By our nature, we know that in thought, word, and deed, we do not glorify God all of the time. We sin. Some of you didn't like your Christmas presents. And you either lied and said, I love it. It's exactly what I wanted. Or you were like, thank you so much. And grumbled to yourself with ungratefulness. 
Or, or maybe you became so focused on trying to make this Christmas absolutely perfect that anything short of a miracle on 34th Street would have been unacceptable. Or perhaps you spent too much time with that family member and that they just do that thing that you can't stand. You thought COVID would keep them away this year and it didn't and it ruined the whole holiday and it just, it just irks you. And the thoughts that you have towards them are sin. And while we probably understand it, they are sin. But even still, our greatest need is to be forgiven. It's the same as the paralytic. What I need, what you need, is for Jesus to say to us, your sins are forgiven. That may not be your greatest felt need. It certainly was not the paralytic's. So while at my first reading, I was frustrated with Christ's seeming misunderstanding as to what this man wanted. He knows our wants and our felt needs. Some of, just because the frustration, it's not his greatest need. It's not our greatest need. The error is on me. He knew what this man and his friends wanted. He's, he's, he's the Lord. He's not confused. Some of us may be in true financial trouble right now. The economy has taken a tank in the last 10 months. That, that is a reality. Our health has been constantly threatened over the past year. You, you may have problems in your home. You may have a really rude boss at work. You may have really apathetic managers and just hate your job. Those are real needs. Those are real felt needs. And yes, in these moments, in those moments, it is good and right for us to fling ourselves onto Christ in his grace and mercy and say, I need help. That's good. But it is not the greatest need. Jesus is of most importance concerned with forgiving us he is far more desiring to cleanse our hearts. Because what is a peaceful home while we are still enemies of God? What is a healthy working environment while we toil under the burden of sin? What good is a healthy body inhabited with a dead soul? What good does a debt-free budget bring without a free record nailed to Christ's cross? And what good are working legs that run headlong into hell. But Jesus stands over us today in our needs and unexpectedly declares, your sins are forgiven. But also among the crowd are some of the religious leaders. Luke's account tells us that some have come as far as Jerusalem to hear Jesus preach. So they've come a long way to make this appearance. And they have been sitting here and have witnessed all of the chaos all of the deconstruction, they have seen the man lowered down and they have heard what Jesus has said, that his sins are forgiven and they're having none of it. For one, they believe that because he is paralyzed, he sinned somehow. It must be. And that his doing right punishment is not the forgiveness of sins, it's not grace, but it's to walk, in, not walk in this life But they also hear Jesus' words and in their hearts go, he can't do that. He doesn't have the authority to say that. He's blaspheming. Only God can forgive sins. And that statement is true. They are right. Only God can forgive sins. I will give them that. Because if I were to stand here this morning and arbitrarily tell you based on nothing, your sins are forgiven. Because I said so. That's scandalous. You should haul me out and run me back to Conway with pitchforks. That is dangerous. That is a claim of divinity. And that is their whole issue. The contention of the scribes is that Christ does not have the authority to forgive sins. 
And there are so many scribes telling us the same thing. How often have we thought on our sin and sought the forgiveness of Christ when the doubts start to step in? Those late night voices that tell you, you've gone too far this time. Nobody sins like you sin. Other sins may be forgivable, but not yours. That is a lie. Christ's death does not stop short at your account. There is not a sinner that God cannot call and forgive. He says in John 6, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and all and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. But Christ, knowing their hearts, calls them on it. He asks them, which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or take up your bed and walk? It's a very interesting challenge. Because the forgiveness of sins does not always come with evidence that we see. Um, it is not demonstrable. It's very easy to say because it's, it's not tangible necessarily. But if you tell a paralytic to walk, you better, you better be bringing it. You better be right. If you, hear the par- if you heal the paralytic, if, if the man who was lowered through the roof is, walks out of here, that's evidence. I ain't never done it. It's pretty good. Listen what he says. So that you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins. So Jesus says that I may have th- authority to forgive sins. Get up. And at the word, Mark says, immediately, he gets up and he takes his bed and he goes home. By this very word, the paralytic gets up. And in fact, everyone's blown away, as we would be. That's a normal response. We've never seen this. And the scribes have their answer then, don't they? Because follow the logic. If only God can forgive sins, and only God heals in this way miraculously, and Jesus healed this way miraculously, well, then he's God. So therefore, because Christ is God, he has the undisputed authority to forgive sins. Because he is the one against whom we have sinned, he is the one in whom we find forgiveness. There's the takeaway this morning. Because Christ has undisputed authority to forgive sins, those who look to him have been pardoned all their sins. All of them. This is a full pardon offered to us in Christ. I think we, I like courtroom dramas. Love them. Love legal dramas. And, and when you watch them, there's always like one episode where somebody's calling the governor of the president for a pardon. And it's this really interesting law where if it's a state law, it's the governor. If it's a federal law, the president, you can just forgive anybody. Just, nope. They did it. Yep. They're forgiven. It's the same thing. And here's what's great about that, if we tie it together. It's an affirmation that they're guilty. Yeah, they they did it. We know that. They're forgiven. And there's not a single judicial entity that can bring anything against them ever again. No one has a word. So how do we take hold of this pardon? We take hold of it by faith. That's what moved Christ to forgive the paralytic. The faith of him and his friends. This strikes at us. Because we feel as if something this good must be earned. Surely, the forgiveness of sins, of all my sins, I've got to do something for that, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Sure, there's no such thing as free forgiveness. There must be something that we must do to justify this free pardon. (laughs) It feels unnatural, but there's no forgiveness that can be earned. 
earned forgiveness is just a bribe. We cannot merely clean up our own act enough to make God's nice list. The debt is too great. But forgiveness paid isn't forgiveness. It's just paying our own debt and we can't do it. Calvin says in his institutes, what is forgiveness but a gift of liberality? Doesn't God not plainly declare that the cause and foundation of forgiveness is to be sought from his goodness alone? But we don't even have the ability to make any movement towards God. We are the paralytic. We cannot walk to him. We cannot crawl to him. We don't even have the ability to make any moves towards God outside of faith. We cannot merit our pardon. As the paralytic brought nothing in himself, neither do we. Calvin again says, for when scripture says by the name of Christ, it means that we are to bring nothing, pretend nothing of our own, but lean entirely on the recommendation of Christ. So it is only by faith that we can take hold of this forgiveness. So then for you this morning that look to Christ by faith, I can stand here and joyfully say to you what Christ has said. And hear it good. Your sins are forgiven. You are free. There is not a scribe in your heart or a lie from Satan that can speak a true word about who you are in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because he has died, was raised, and ascended. You are forgiven and seen as righteous. Not just as if you never sinned, but just as if you had always behaved. And so that you may know that Christ still has the authority to forgive sins, he invites us to this table. He invites us to offer us bread and wine as the frequent reminder that he, he was broken and bled for the forgiveness of sins. And when we feast on him by faith, we are strengthened by his spirit. And we're reminded again, as we will be just now, you are forgiven. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for the forgiveness we find in Christ. We ask that you uh, continue to be with us now as we use your means of grace to remind ourselves of you. Amen.